Hello and welcome to Code and Crack. This and is welcome. the Excel is Code edition. This is your weekly technology digest from the team at Terminus DB, where the crack is always Moorish. We break up the chat into three segments and talk us about something that we're excited about internally or interested in internally, some technology in the world, and something topical. This week, we're going to talk about what do you mean by distributed. Uh, we're then going to talk about why we love Excel, and I in particular am a great Excel fan. Um, and then finally, will technology make people smarter? I'm Luke Feeney. It's Friday. We're excited and we are joined by, amazingly, this week, we do not have the benevolent dictator for life, Gavin. He is away in Paris enjoying himself. But we do have a stellar cast and crew with us this week. The database guru, Matthias. Hello, everybody. The man who puts the dev in DevOps, Robin. Hey. The creative of the core, Sean. Howdy. Uh, and the marketeer's marketeer, Vivek. Hi, everyone. So, uh, I actually, you know what happened to me last weekend? I have strained my jaw. It, the muscle in my jaw has been strained. That's how much talking that I spend my time doing. So I have a little bit of a, a jaw strain to bring to you this week, but I'm still surviving and still able to speak, which is the most important bit of it. And so just powering through it. For just powering through. Best. That's it. Powering through. Amazing. The dedication. dedication. I know. Yeah. Putting my body on the line. So we are looking at Robin's code. Robin, what are we looking at? Uh, not entirely my code, no worries. I think Gavin, our benevolent dictator, wrote. Oh, we're looking, we're looking at your show. screen with code on it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, we implemented GZIP and Deflate support in Terminus DB uh, to support compressed payloads uh, inside the server. Like normally, uh, JSONs can get pretty big, and often when data is repeated, it can be compressed much more efficiently. And that's why we are uh, supporting a GZIP encoded uh, bodies inside the requests now. Cool. And so what does this and code do? It opens. It basically extracts the body uh, from a certain HTTP request. You can see a re request payload, uh, payload into output. So uh, you have a stream that comes in. And uh, we open it with Z open. It's basically inside the street product library, a function to open uh, gzips. Um, that's it. Then we open uh, the gzip part and decompress it. Sorry, Robin. It's, uh, it's just a bit confusing because of the uh, way the predicate is uh, done, but the uh, stream the is actually is the, the output. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the second is the request. Yeah, that's yeah. the input. Then bam, finally it opens inside uh, the beautiful stream as the output. Hey, but Sean, normally uh, the second, the last predicate is mostly yeah. the. Yeah. yeah. So usually, uh, yeah, in, in in prologue of what I've been learning the last since I've been here, uh, you would put the outputs at the end and the inputs in the beginning. Um, but in this case, we're uh, using the atoms uh, or functors to pattern match. Uh, stream, string, and JSON dict at the beginning of the HTTP read UTF predicate um, so that you can choose to get a different type of output uh, for the uh, request. So in some cases, you want to read a stream of JSON documents. In other cases, you want just want to get a single string. And in other cases, you just want a JSON dictionary or basically an object. It makes a lot of uh, sense, Sean. And uh, why does it need to be pattern match on the first argument instead of the second? Like, that could be the case as well, right? It could be, yeah. Uh, there's nothing technically that prevents it. I think it's just a bit more efficient uh, if you the way the prologue uh, does this, that uh, it, it can efficiently identify the pattern on the first argument. Nice. So we support deflate and uh, gzip 
And if Street Prolog ever decides to support more, uh, then we can just add those. It's very nicely declaratively specified here. And so, Rob, yeah, the uh, part. yeah, the uh, it looks quite simple. Uh, if you go back to that uh, HTTP read UTF predicate, uh, this was, but it was actually uh, teamwork uh, trying to figure out uh, what was wrong when we were doing this, um, and the three prolog um, z open um, default options uh support multi-part um gzip yeah, part yeah so multi-part gzip so it would we would uh, give it a stream and then it would just hang and our server would time out and it took a while for us to figure out why and then we realized okay if we're just we just want a single uh, file in that gzip stream we need to tell uh, zopen to not support multi-part so we pass multi-part with false Cool. So what what are, what are we doing with this? Like, what what does the code uh, eventually achieve um, through the the g zipping? Like, what why how big are things that are inputting that you have to use it this way? Well, um, it is a lot faster. Like, if you have less to transfer, then uh, it's uh, mostly faster. Mm -hmm. uh, g zip also doesn't use that much uh, CPU. It's a pretty lightweight uh, compression algorithm. Uh, so it's not that much of a bottleneck on the CPU side of things, but it can compress significantly. We had a 80 meg JSON that was like compressed down to 700 kilobytes. But to be fair, that was a lot of repetition. The more repetition in your file, uh, the better it can be compressed. Um, but yeah, it can compress quite significantly. So yeah, that's pretty nice. Very nice. Very nice all together. Compression is always good, making things a little bit smaller. So and the world runs on compression. Like uh, you couldn't do this uh, whole broadcast without good audio compression. Is it using GZIP? Uh, no. Other uh, algorithms better suited for like uh, for audio. Uh, audio. Yeah. It'd be nice if we were or using. It. Yeah, GZIP works really well with uh, text. Um, but audio and video typically work better with different compressions. Different compressions, compression, okay. Compression, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, Matthias, what do we mean by distributed? Wow, what a segue. That's amazing. <laughs> 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 uh, what do we mean by distributed? Distributed generally means that uh, you have either your code or your data uh, on different systems that uh, yeah are connected to each other, usually over network, um, and that form like a coherent system altogether. And why is that? Why is that important? Like, why you know? Go ahead, Robin. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, like uh, Git is, I think, the best example of a distribute, distributed distributed uh, system. Though, like a lot of distributed systems have also like a centralized point as well because a lot of the data systems describe themselves as distributed and is that what they mean by that sorry a lot of what's called self distributed like databases and guys in the cloud they call themselves mm -hmm. distributed i mean are they just talking about that they have that they're in data centers around the world and they have failover or are they actually yeah. distributed well, I mean, <laughs> what is actually distributed? Generally, they don't lie. <laughs> there is actually something uh, to people saying they're distributed. So generally, it means uh, they have some scaling ability. So uh, you can spawn multiple servers uh, to extend the capacity of your database. So either being able to store more data or uh, to be able to query it faster because you have multiple uh, database nodes to query this. Uh, so yeah, failover can be a part of that so that when a system goes down, another system can take over for it and, uh, people on the outside may not even notice that something happens. Uh, it's not necessary there for something to be called distributed though. Mm, mm. And why is like, why is it good? I mean, I suppose loads of those peer to peer systems are distributed like torrents and stuff like that. Is that right? 
that's definitely a very very, very distributed, distributed system yeah <laughs> so, I, so I mean the the benefits it really depends on again why would you have something be distributed in case of torrents like what what makes it cool to be distributed is that there's not a central node that you rely on for all your uh, illegal mm. movies and stuff <laughs> <laughs> which which the which the the, the 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 police or whatever may go and take down instead you have uh, a lot of individuals who uh, may individually be arrested and have their computers taken down or whatever, but as a whole, uh, it will stay up. Uh, but you still, even so in that sort of system, you do need some central points. I mean, you need some catalog of what's yeah, available. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So there needs there needs to be some way to discover like who actually has these files. Uh, and I mean. There is even dis distributed ways of going about doing that. Uh, to a certain degree. Uh, so for example, there are uh, distributed hash tables where if you know what you're looking for, like you have a hash of the data that you're looking for, you can ask a distributed system uh, for more information about that hash, uh, like what files does it represent? And then ultimately, who actually has those files? But yeah, you, you will always need some kind of entry point. Like you will need to have that hash, for example, to be mm. able to, to even get anywhere. But yeah, no, quite a lot of that can be distributed, though. And in this case, it's really about uh, not having the central point of failure. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose the um, the 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 big one is the is the word that we shall not mention, where there's a lot of talk about distributed um, payment systems, um, but they all have <laughs> um, they all have big central points as well. They definitely do. I mean, yeah. if you want to on-ramp and off-ramp from any of those, you have to kind of go through an exchange and therefore you're coming through a centralized point. Technically, you don't really have to go through an exchange. It's just that it's difficult. It's so much more convenient, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, of course, you can go kind of wallet to wallet or you can just send somebody, you could put a... Uh, put your Bitcoin on a um, a thumb drive or a USB drive and post it in the mail right. to somebody. Right. So that'd be super distributed, you know? Okay. I mean, if you're kind of getting into the real world of sending things around as well and drop-offs and all sorts of things like that, you could build yourself a distributed network. It's kind of reminding, it's a little bit of a reminder of so how they built some of those terrorist networks as well. <laughs> where you'd have limited knowledge about other cells. There wouldn't be one member of each cell that would know one member of another cell. And they'd be the only people that they would know each other. And therefore, if they were caught, they'd only be able to tell the information about one other person in one other cell if they were caught and tortured. Also, There's a yeah. system the armies have used for ages. Yeah, and that's kind of like a distributed system in one way. Yeah, I guess it is. But I mean, uh, those kinds of systems tend to be very hierarchical, right? Like you still have this yeah. central leadership that uh, then <laughs> tries very hard not to get arrested, I guess, in the case of uh, these kinds of networks. But uh, yeah, so, so there is kind of that central point of failure there still. Uh, whereas I think with something like torrents, you, you really don't really, you don't have that central point of failure anymore. Like search websites can go down, uh, but others will pop up. They they are very easily replaceable. Um, so you think torrents is unkillable now? I mean, you think yeah. the resources taken to kill torrents would be basically like you know burn all the computers? <laughs> I think. So. I mean, I'm not sure how it is these days. I have not really followed the statistics, but some years ago, like the vast majority of internet traffic was actually was it? torrents. Wow. <laughs> yes. Maybe it's probably changed now that like Netflix and sites are uh, actual has, services. Yeah, I was looking at some stats about it yesterday or day before itself, and uh, right. with all these OTT platforms coming and content being available quite cheap, uh, yeah. with internet connections becoming good, torrents are no more really uh, used by too many people anymore. Mm. Yeah, well, I think they were never really used by too many people. But it's just that the vast amounts of data that those handful of people were using was kind of dominating everything else. I, 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 don't, I don't mean to be uh, too crass or anything. And I know that the other people on this uh, podcast are very um, high thinkers that wouldn't go down into the gutter where my thoughts might go. But I think the real difference is obviously that we have 
you porn. Um, and that <laughs> porn is now very readily available and it doesn't have to be torrented around in the same way that it was because, of course, porn makes up a very large segment of the overall internet traffic. Maybe I'm wrong, but that'd be my gut instinct as to why that's changed. I think that's that would be like, fun to get uh, some statistics like, on. It is, it uh, is more true. than 50%, right, uh, of the internet. Yeah, exactly. It's porn. If you if you look at the top 10 websites right now, I think three or four of them would probably be porn websites. Exactly, exactly. And I mean, it, it, the porn industry has been a real innovator when it comes to distributing content and um, how they come about some technical solutions for, for solving some of those problems as well. It's quite interesting when you look into it because they were obviously, there's so much money available within the industry. Uh, they were ones that were at the front end of how you distribute content um, widely. We'll have to do a further segment on the distributed nature of uh, porn servers at some stage, but, you know, that's really getting into the weeds. Um, so that was very interesting. And, I mean, I suppose from, from our perspective then, wh why is distributed important? Like, why are we excited about distributed? <sighs> So, I mean, for us, uh, there is a, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, there is definitely also the single point of failure thing, um, where if you have Terminus DB, uh, you could host your own instance and someone else can host their own instance and they can have the same data. And you can like push and pull data between those two instances. Uh, and one can go down and you still have all your data locally uh, to query. So you don't rely on the central point uh, to be online and you being online to be able to work with your data. Uh, but another big reason for uh, being distributed for us is uh, that using the same underlying data backend, uh, we can spawn like an arbitrary amount of servers that can perform queries on this data. So this is the uh, horizontal scaling aspect. Um, so yeah, as, as more people need to query the same data, uh, you can just keep adding more servers, more servers, uh, and it will just keep working. So those two aspects uh, come to mind for me. Maybe other people have some other ideas about this. Yeah, I think what's also very useful about this is, uh, for instance, you can have one server uh, in Europe and one in the US, and you can uh, say to your US customers, like, please connect to the US one, since that's obviously faster. Um, so that's a big advantage, I think, as well. And then you're and just the replicating part. across from the two, are you, Robin? To make yeah, sure you that you have the same data pull. all the time. <laughs> yeah, you just push and yeah, pull between the two. Yeah. yeah. And the second one? Uh, the second one, I think it's very useful for collaboration as well. Uh, like, um, it, if you have only one central server, you have to be connected to it all the time. Whereas in our distributed uh, nature, almost every computer can be a node in itself. So imagine you are uh, with your laptop in some kind of place where you don't have good internet. Uh, then you are still able to commit your work locally and then push it later uh, to another server. Uh, so that's, I think, a big advantage of uh, the distributed uh, nature uh, of Terminus V as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting that. I mean, I don't want to go back to the Bitcoin analogy too much, but... Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they they always go on about how the 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 chain for Bitcoin has been kept very tight. I think it's a you know, only seven hundred megabytes or something like that. So it, it's very small by active choice, so that any individual commute computer can become a node in the network. Um, and how like you know with Ethereum or something like that, obviously it's a few very large uh, central points become much more important but that in a properly distributed system, any individual computer can, you know, play its part. And really, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about in some way, that you have lots of computers that can be part of a single overall network. They can work locally and then push centrally. And, and that's like it. I mean, that's Git. No? That's what yeah, we're talking that, about. Yeah, that's definitely like it, yeah. yeah. You, 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 what, what do you think, Sean? Do you have any um, pearls of Git-like wisdom to sprinkle on our... Distributed debate? <laughs> no, no pearls here. <laughs> cool, guys. So let's move on to the next topic. So why we love Excel. 
And the I game. mean, is innocence really a plural though? Let's 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 start uh, there. Uh, uh, is it? <laughs> I can't say that I'm very fond of Excel. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. You probably have very good things to say about it, but uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. No, that's not okay. A well, tell us, tell us not why you're not fond of it. Um, I mean, there's, there's several reasons. Uh, I mean, first of all, I just don't get very excited about spreadsheet software, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> other than that, I mean, give, you, uh, give, give, give you audio software on Linux any day of the week over spreadsheet software. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, I mean, that's, that's just various things, but, but mostly it's just, uh, it's, it's this weird format that's. As That's a programmer, the beauty I can't of really it. Deal with it. It's so like it's half database, convenient. half database, half word processor, and half programming language. It's it's three halves to make yeah. a perfect whole. <laughs> it's purely That's functional, right. Matthijs. You would like that, uh, don't you? Like oh, it's no. very pure. Oh. All those pure functions with no uh, state. <laughs> Are they actually pure functions with no state? I'm not so sure, actually. I think you can do very ugly things there. But yeah, no, I mean, true. I recognize <laughs> that that Excel was actually, well, not, not necessarily Excel, but like spreadsheet software was yeah. like a big advantage to like people who were previously like actually maintaining paper books, uh, making all kinds of calculation errors and uh, and suffering as a result. So, I mean, sure, it's it's an improvement over that. Uh, so Chuck, I'm still not we have, have to, to come it. across to you because you know we know that Pythonistas hate Excel. Pythonistas, no. especially in financial services, have all built careers saying that we're better than Excel by using Python. Well, the thing is, I don't think it's like we hate Excel, but like you know, it's just Excel is quite bad to um, to kind of work with. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that it sounds like the same thing, right? But but the thing is that, like, um, so I, I can only say for uh, people who kind of similar backgrounds me, you know, used to work in data science and stuff like we love pandas and loading uh, Excel file is just more complicated than loading a CSV because of the funny codings, um, encodings and like funny um, stuff inside. Even if a relatively like flat CSV, it could be a bit like you know, things may pop up that is unexpected. So that's why it's uh, also, if we get really big, it will get frozen. So, <laughs> so yeah, well, it has its limits. Definitely, we found that during the pandemic that there's a million and what, like 1.1 million or something like that lines is the maximum within a, an Excel. Whoever yeah. would let an Excel get that big was just insane. <laughs> but there you I go. Yeah, I remember I used to work for a company and then like kind of we have to kind of work with another team that they love using uh, Excel and, the uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 what's that, like the private table or something like that. And um, so we kind of like talk about how we kind of integrate the data and stuff. And then they kind of complain, oh, it's too big. It will froze the Excel out. And then basically I roll my eye and think like, why do you use Excel? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm reminded we, we had this, uh, or Gavin had this um, uh, our article not so long ago on Hacker News about Excel is code, um, or Excel as code. So it's trying to get people to think about you know, using Excel in the same way that coders um, approach it. I mean, it's Turing complete now, so it is a coding language. We could, we could rewrite Discord in uh, Excel if we really, really wanted to. Uh, it might not run so well, but it, we could do it. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the first comments and one of the ones that ended up near the top was about how somebody has made their career on taking things out of Excel and turning them into web applications. And that's kind of the world that we've ended up with. We've taken things that were in Excel um, and we've turned them into web apps. And there's just an endless number of them now. There's ones to do your, you know, your HR lists. There's and they all have complex functions that are on top of that. But effectively, they're just like big Excels, but turned into web apps. And I, I don't know if that's a better world than the world where we just had Excels and uh, there were fewer programs and it was easier and everything wasn't just in a browser and we had Chromebooks that were, you know, trying to destroy our brains. <laughs> 
Oh. Yeah, I feel like this kind of application looks like you know the you know the five minute craft videos and stuff like that. They are using like you know the hacks that is like using things that are not meant to be doing that to uh to do something to to get the views and stuff. So <laughs> yeah, well, I saw somebody who was doing coding in um in PowerPoint. There's a great video wow. I'll put I'll, I'll link up to it of somebody coding <laughs> yeah. using PowerPoint and using uh, selection tables within PowerPoint slides and build a you know a fairly complex program out of it. Yeah, I mean, like, you do you if you want to spend time doing that. I won't stop you, but, like, I won't do that because I am sure that that's a bit of, uh, in my opinion, waste of my time. So. Yeah, but you see, the beauty of Excel is people know it. So many people know it, and so many people are expert in it. And they're expert able to build, you know, really wow. cool stuff. Yeah, I mean... Like you, you can't avoid that only because there are so many people sitting in the office using it and they may not be coders, you know. They are coders. They are coders. I think, I think a lot of people are indeed experts and they can do amazing things with Excel spreadsheets. And then uh, they leave the company and go elsewhere and they leave behind the spreadsheet with like an awful amount of undocumented code that, that nobody really knows how it works anymore. And... Uh, it just has to be kept around because it's like integral to like five different business processes and uh, and and, and yeah. no software developer has ever done that with their code. <laughs> no, and, and often you can't open it in a in a newer version or something like that. Or like you know, it's just I think I think yeah I I don't know why people be all these like all these stuff on top of Excel. I think the only reason I can see that is reasonable is because the business call for it right the business want to use it so we have to kind of work with it but if you kind of say that okay now you're in charge of everything you can do whatever you want i think most of these people who build complex stuff will be like okay let's do something else <laughs> i I, th I think a big aspect of it is yeah that that uh, excel it is installed on people's system and it's approved and people are allowed to do this or well maybe never explicitly allowed but certainly it's not uh, they're not prevented from doing this so, uh, whereas like if you want to install a bit of software in a lot of companies, uh, that is quite a hassle to do that. Uh, if Enormous you want to build a program, hassle. well, you're never going to get like uh, some some like financing from that or like like allocated time for that. But if you work in Excel, which already is an approved system and already may be part of your job to use Excel, uh, like you can just go ahead and do that. Uh, it's, it's already there. You already have the tools. Uh, so the bar is just very low to, to do that. But isn't isn't it like feel free and safe to like open an Excel file? Because like if if Excel is something that you can do so many like complex stuff, but it's le lack the you know the, the 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 transparency of seeing what it does, then it could be very dangerous, right? So like like in security point of view, I think is 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 not the best thing. Yeah, yeah although I don't I know do what it's like today, my but are disabled now. Yeah, I think I think this this used to be like a huge virus yeah. factor, like a lot of viruses coming into companies this way. But it's gone now. I, I think there has been improvements in that in that yeah. area. That's not so much of an issue anymore. Yeah, if if things can't be express expressed as text, I am <laughs> I'm skeptical because I can't see what's <laughs> inside. <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, I have a very hot take on this. Okay, sometimes Excel or spreadsheets may be overused, but I think they are sometimes still underused. Here, Big time. Like, uh, for instance, uh, Google Drive spreadsheets uh, lets you parse HTML. Few people know this, but it parses HTML very nicely into tables and the like. So you can look well, at some random site with a table and parse no. it. That's amazing, right? <laughs> And uh, I made a email templating system in Google uh, Spreadsheets as well. Uh, it's very useful. Yeah. So yeah, and you made a, you made a ticker for it. our um, for our uh, Docker downloads as yeah. well. <laughs> nice scripts, exactly. lashing them in there. Perfect place for it. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. Um, clear spreadsheet. No need for any web app interface. Just give me a spreadsheet. Let me see the data. Yeah, well, well, I'm I'm not surprised it can pass HTML because it it is a web app. <laughs> of course, it can pass HTML. Um, but yeah, whether people put it put that into like uh, in there is is another question though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah I kind of think that um, 
in general, there are, you know, a lot of people that are doing complicated stuff with Excel that's akin to coding. They're building financial models. They're building representations of the world and then running scenarios through them in financial services often in order to make predictions about the the future. And maybe there might be better ways to be slightly more accurate or more uh, succinct about how you do those. But people are good at what they're doing and they enjoy working with those tools or they they do work with those tools anyway. And that there's always a tendency, there's always a tendency to say, oh, you know, well, but there's something better, you know, it'd be better to do it this way rather than to kind of say, well, you know, that's that's what, what's been done there is really interesting and good. And I kind of, you know, I, I read this article that I shared earlier um, about um, uh, on Wired, which is about how people are building automations into Excel and how there's a bunch you know, of new companies coming up who are building all these automations in Excel. And I think it's kind of an exciting area again. You know, what, what, what was my most my problem with that is that like people will usually be of this like uh, complex like application on Excel, like it's not reproducible because they are not purely like, well, there are some code in it, but there are a lot of like, still you move this here, this cell and stuff is like, is not purely a script that is, you can just run it and it will rep- replicate what it is. Um, it kind of, it makes it very hard to maintain like what uh, we have discussed that like someone left a company, and it left something behind that is like impossible to maintain because it's not scripted. <laughs> So if 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 Excel you can export it as script, then I think it, it, I I would say that it would ex, like expand the whole use case much better. Um, if an Excel file can be just like you know, let's say because like for example Docker, you know like you can have a Docker uh, compose script that you can just like spin up the container every time the same thing, right? So if you can have a script that spin up a Excel file is always the same thing, then then it would be much better mm. in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my only point there is that the world is full of poorly and undocumented code that is doing all sorts of essential work as well that's left behind by people, often people that might take consultancies then and come back and fix the code for much greater amounts of money and things like that. And, it, it you know, Excel's not definitely not, you know, it's definitely a big one there, but it's only a big one there because... It's so big. I mean, there's nearly what they say two billion users of Excel or spreadsheet technology around the world, um, and it definitely has the largest section of coders of any programming language. If we're going to say that Excel is a programming language, I know that might be disputed a little bit. Um, but I, I, you know, I've come across lots of cases where you're like, you know, what is this code that's been left behind and everybody's given out to say that it's totally undocumented and they have to go into archaeology in order to find out what it does and then start again. What do you think, uh, Sean? What's your Excel view? I'd like to uh, stop people emailing around Excel spreadsheet files. I I would too. uh, That's a great idea. It's not that I have a product. I uh, it's not that I'm about to launch a no, product that tries to help no, with that or anything. Yeah. But <laughs> it just it just really depresses me uh, when um, so my wife is in a works in a university and you know she collects data as part of an experiment or something, and then they're pass emailing these things around and then um, Word documents as well and and for uh, papers and then they're leaving comments or making changes and then. You don't know who's uh, done what to win at what time because somebody makes change or, or makes a recommendation on the same thing that somebody else does. But yeah, it's it's just a horrible mess. It is. It's a terrible mess. And none of the solutions that have been put in place yet are, are good for that to be able to see, you know, who made which changes, whether they're important changes. And then things like, you know, testing. Stuff that you guys spend a lot of your time thinking about is, you know, testing, but we don't have any of those tests now on Excel. We can't do, you know, unit tests or anything like that to see whether there's something has broken in the code. Uh, And as we've seen from some of those big stories, um, that's had severe consequences. Uh, whereby banks have lost lots of money because their risk modeling was put out within Excel uh, workbooks. 
Um, and then you have all of the stuff around uh, things being turned into dates. Um, what's the uh, the funny... There's a funny um, meme around a Venn diagram. And on one side of the um, Venn diagram is incels. And then on the, <laughs> o- the other side of the Venn diagram is excels. And the overlap <laughs> is they can't tell if something's a date. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but, but in genetic research, for example, they had to change the names of some of the genes because Excel was mangling them so much and so regularly. I remember that. There was a paper about it, I believe, about yeah. how many bad data there is out there right now because a uh, bunch of stuff just gets auto-converted. Yeah, so if you could build something that would give you testing in Excel, I mean, that would be incredibly powerful. So if you have enough... Uh, mangled genes in Excel, do you get a virus? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You're not allowed to email Excels anymore because you have that virus. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think, Vivek? What, what, what's the marketing perspective on this? You guys are very um, Excel heavy. Yeah, so I think everybody else uh, on our... Twitch session right now is probably looking more towards very complex applications. Uh, I think if you simplify it uh, into like what general people do, like marketing people do, we don't need that many cells to do any analysis. I do agree with Sean when there's too many emails back and forth with multiple Excel sheets. Uh, It becomes confusing and there's a lot of data loss or incorrect data there. But I think the uh, the mass that is actually using Excel also shows that it is something useful. May not be useful for very complex tasks, but definitely for generalists who just need to get some work done or do quick calculations or see different views of their data. I, I think it works uh, well there. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of the collaboration related features is a big gap. Uh, and that's why we have kind of thought about version Excel to try and solve it. And it will work for some segment of people, but it will not work for some someone who is trying to build a very complex model around Excel necessarily. Or it could at, at a certain point, but definitely not now. But it, yeah. I, I, I definitely find it a helpful tool for myself. Yeah, my, my brother works in uh, wind engineering for one of the big Danish wind engineering companies. And he says that there's, you know, this constant drive amongst the technical teams and the management to try and move away from Excel and to kind of impose um, web apps so that people can collaborate more effectively. But that on every single one of them, um, the export to Excel button is the most used Um, because people have, their brains have become Excelized. So they see things best when they see them in Excel. I think it's not just that. It's it's also that Excel is still the uh, universal workaround for people. Yeah. Like when a web yeah. application doesn't deliver on what people actually want, mm. then they can go to Excel and just do stuff there and like mail it around again and do all those bad practices, which I mean, do get things done. And that's why people do them. Uh, whereas waiting for <laughs> a web app to get updated with the feature you want, you, I mean, you could wait forever for that. Yeah, it's well, very I would true. Say that- there's export to CSV and export to Excel, I would definitely click the export to CSV. It's just that most of the time you don't give them the choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, Chuck, you're a data scientist. Well, maybe. Uh, I am not saying that I can speak for everybody, but I do speak for people who kind of have similar backgrounds as me. Yeah, but CSVs are still spreadsheets in the end. Huh? Oh. They're kind of, well, our relational databases are kind of spreadsheets in the end, no? <laughs> I mean, the thing with spreadsheets is that you have formulas that, that can calculate uh, cells from other cells. You definitely don't have that with a CSV. Well, you can do that with, uh, with a query script that like can do fairly complicated stuff if you dare to write a thousand line of uh, SQL, but yeah. <laughs> so which makes somebody smarter, a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet? Neither. Uh, well, a CSV makes you smarter because then you're a data scientist and then you're way smarter than just a simple <laughs> analyst. 
No, but like CSV is just playing. <laughs> it's just playing. That is like more. You know, you can you can do more. Like I mean, like it's more um, flexible. But like Excel, you can only open with Excel on. You know, but it, it you could you could embed a lot of like things inside. That's why, in my point of view, it's also a little bit insecure. Um, mm, so, yeah. so that that Sean, that's a great question and perfect segue because we've only got a few minutes left to our final question, which is: Will technology make people smarter? <laughs> I'm always when I when I read this question first, I was reminded of that TV show Idiocracy. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's the one about the future where the idiots take over and the guy travels the future. It's quite a bad movie, but it is slightly funny at times. And basically, the thesis there is that um, the technologically able uh, push off having uh, children until they're uh, past their prime. Um, because they have other focuses and then uh, the people of lower IQs and intelligence have lots of kids and eventually outbreed um, the smarter folk and actually the whole human race gets dumber and dumber up it's, to the it's a terrible <laughs> premise though like, that's, I know, that's I know. absolutely horrible it's, it's, it's correlating IQ with uh, income level is I, know, exactly I, know, yes. I know it is a horrible <laughs> premise but they end up uh, trying to water their fields with Gatorade and uh, it all it's falls apart yeah, yeah. but yeah so this is it. this is what came to mind when I read that question but I, I don't know I don't think technology will make people smarter i mean you could have a implant in your uh, brain that would allow you to access a lot of information but whether that would make you smarter i suppose there technology in the case of maybe genetic manipulation could make people smarter potentially there's, there's on some a, scale of smartness yeah there's a bit of ambiguity in the question because it could mean make in individuals smarter or make population as a whole uh smarter um if you're you're looking at the individual level in that case right yeah no but even if you look at it at an individual level like it does uh if there are more individuals it becomes the mass right so it becomes your population becoming smarter well if you're talking about putting an, uh, an implant in somebody uh, it's probably going to come down to who can afford to do that, in which case you might make the people who can afford mm -hmm. to do that smarter, but you won't make uh, anybody else smarter. Yeah, I think there's so... a game talking about that. Is DS DSX, one of the DSX games. It's similar to what you just talked about, Sean. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think once you start getting into genetically manipulated intelligence in children, you, st you open a Pandora's box that's very hard to get back on because once your neighbor's uh, kid is, you know, 20% better IQ or 40% better IQ or, you know, 40 points better IQ than your kid and is therefore getting all the advantages of a society that's built very much around those straightforward um, analysis of intelligence and getting the advantages and maybe the higher income levels that might come with that, then it's very difficult for people to resist, you know, so you're just not going to get that and you're going to have a dumb kid. Um, and sure, you'll have pockets of people that are uh, ideologically motivated to resist, but you're going to have a lot of people that are just going to be keeping up with the Joneses and therefore getting the treatment in order to have the smart kids. Well, the thing is that I think the the way that you measure like who is smart and who is not is like a bit uh, obscure. Like you know, IQ doesn't re reflect everything. Actually, like people now say, oh, maybe like is like EQ is more important or things like that. But I also think that like is 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 more complicated than that. It's not like you know, oh, someone who got better genes or something. You know, like um, yeah, it's just that, yeah. I just think that that argument is not very valid by itself. <laughs> yeah, but in, you know, there there is a formula to a certain degree for shape rotators to do well in the world. <laughs> and if you could predict which ones are going to be shape rotators and get those genes together, then you know, but we don't want everybody to be shape rotator. Like, no, sure, on a, on a macro level, we definitely don't. But uh, and and therefore, that's what I'm saying at a population level. But I'm saying at an individual level, you know. 
would your would your parents not want you to have the best chance of having the highest income possible and blah blah blah? Well, I from. think for for who who would have the best chance would be like how much money their parents has, like rather than their IQ and other stuff, you know. <laughs> sure. Yeah, rich begets rich, but yeah. the way the way to break through that, and the way that certainly in the last twenty years, one of the main ladders for in, in the West, that is at least I don't know, and elsewhere in in on the subcontinent, I'm sure of effect too is. Um, is access to uh, maths and science education, so STEM education, and then particularly jobs in in software, software engineering. Um, And those are very maths, IQ types of things, and those are quite genetically predisposed towards. I mean, maybe, maybe I'm entirely wrong, but that's certainly my feeling. But we also need people who are good, like good at working with people to be managers, right? So, well... I mean, choose your own adventure, I would say. <laughs> what do you think, Vivek? Do you think that if people could give their kids uh, guaranteed 30 extra points of IQ uh, in India, they'd go for it? Uh, in India, people do anything to make their kids smarter. It's the main reason why they send their kids abroad to study as well, right? Yeah, it's a similar in, in Ireland, or it certainly was the more so. This than... economy, everybody wants to compete and get the best for the kids exactly and whatever percent you can get to get better you'll do it well then now it become that actually a lot of graduate think that they are actually better well off without the degree because now they are like in debt and like you know they are also starting with this like mediocre job that doesn't give them like much better job like with a degree so it's still um I think it's it's go back to the 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 the, the rule to win is to have rich parents. So <laughs> yeah, but then you get things like you know these guys Bloom, what they call Bloom Foundation, Bloom University, Bloom Institute Technology, who are software. It's a software. Uh, it's a professional software education, and what they do is they take a cut of your salary. So they don't actually charge for the university or the course, and they'll do it for a year or two but they'll take a cut of your salary after that. So the economic models shift around. Wait, for how long? Uh, for quite a while. I think they're quite proven. They actually, they, they, secure, they securitize it all as well. So they turn it into bonds and then resell it out. Um, wow. Yeah, it's super financialized kind of, and pretty weird. Kind of getting like indentured servitude vibes from that, but... Uh... Yeah, but you get that. I mean, it's that goes both ways, debt, isn't it? But, uh, <laughs> but like, if you take out a bunch of debt, a student debt, no, you go definitely, for it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's also, yeah, but that's also a pretty shitty situation, though. Yeah, but like, but then the, then the student will be like enslaved by them for X amount of years, right? They have to. Uh, what, what what if you decide to to not pursue your job? Fine. And like, if you get less, if you earn less than fifty k, then you never pay anything back. Hmm. But you see, most people want to earn like money, you know, most people go into it because they're like, I want to be a rich Google software dev and earn 240K or whatever. The good thing about that approach is the uh, company is, or I guess the educators incentivized to educate, to get, make the person successful. And to get them a job. And actually they spend a lot of their resources just trying to get you into a job at the far end. Yeah. Yeah. They won't guarantee you like the best education, but they guarantee you a job. That's it. Yeah. And, and I mean, what I see certainly looking, I mean, obviously I'm not of that generation, but when I look at Zoomers, I see that people are so focused on getting a job. And maybe that's kind of coming up through the 2008 crisis um, that they uh, felt that insecurity around being able to get a job. But there's a real focus on getting a job. But that fall back into like what we had in the old days, right? Like a, apprenticeship, like you kind of work with very low wages or even no wages under like someone and then to guarantee that you would get into the business and you would, you know, have a job afterwards or something like That's that. That's it. You know, instead of pushing atoms though, now you're pushing bits on your apprenticeship. Okay. Well, that was fantastic. Another great code and crack. Really enjoyed it this week. Um, a distributed Excel smarts is what we all need. Uh, if we can build so smart, smart distributed Excel, then we're, we're one, two, three winning. So mm-hmm. thanks a lot. We won't be here next week because we're uh, based in Europe and it's Good Friday next week, at least for those in the, um, the Western part of the former Roman Empire. 
Yeah, in the it's Eastern. also a national holiday in South Africa. Oh, it's a national holiday in South Africa. So in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, it, it, the Easter takes a little <laughs> bit longer to come. Um, but in here in the West, we have Easter next week, so we won't have it next Friday, but we'll be back in two weeks. So it was great having you, and thanks for listening. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.